Gentlemen, we gather here to dissect one of the most pivotal encounters of the Second World War, the Battle of the Bulge. Our collective insights will shed light on the strategic nuances and critical decisions that shaped its outcome. Indeed, the Ardennes Offensive represented a bold stroke by the Wehrmacht, aiming to sever the Allied front and capture Antwerp, a maneuver intended to alter the war's course, relying on surprise and audacity. Surprise and audacity, while commendable, are no substitutes for firepower, logistics, and air supremacy. These elements ultimately dictate the battlefield's dynamics. Firepower alone doesn't win wars. Leadership and strategy do. The Ardennes was as much a test of wills as it was of strength. The German offensive, albeit initially successful, underestimated the Allied resilience and strategic ingenuity. Resilience? I'll tell you about resilience. My third army was engaged in a headlong race across France when we turned north to break the siege of Bastogne. That's not just resilience, that's audacity and speed, coupled with the relentless pursuit of victory. The principle of audacity is not unique to the Western Front. On the Eastern Front, we employed encirclement and deep operations to grind down the enemy, leveraging our numerical and material superiority. Similar to the Battle of the Bulge, strategic depth and reserve mobilization were crucial. The element of surprise was indeed our last bid for a strategic advantage. Despite initial successes, the weight of Allied air power and logistics turned the tide against us, a testament to the importance of controlling the skies and sustaining an army's momentum. This battle illuminated the criticality of intelligence, terrain, weather, and the element of surprise in military strategy. As we delve further into our discussion, we shall dissect these components in detail, analyzing their influence on the outcome of the Battle of the Bulge and the broader conflict at hand. The Ardennes Offensive took us by surprise, a strategic miscalculation on our part. It showcased the tenacity of the German forces at a time when we might have underestimated their capability. Indeed, the element of surprise was crucial. The Fuhrer insisted on secrecy and rapid movement. We exploited the Allies' complacency, orchestrating a blitz through harsh terrain under radar. It was not complacency, but a gross underestimation and an intelligence failure. Had we properly recognized the signs and gathered more precise intelligence, the initial shock could have been mitigated. Intelligence, as vital as it is, is only one part of the puzzle. Adaptability and rapid response are key. American forces, though caught off guard, demonstrated remarkable resilience in adjusting to the unexpected. The surprise caught us with our pants down, no doubt. But it's the soldier's spirit to adapt and overcome. We did just that, adjusted our strategies on the fly, and gave Jerry a run for his money. On the Eastern Front, we learned early the price of underestimating the enemy. Continual vigilance and reconnaissance are critical. Your Western intelligence seemed to have failed in that regard. The Ardennes was deliberately chosen for its perceived impassibility and the Allies' belief that it was a secondary front. That miscalculation allowed us to penetrate deep behind your lines before you could react appropriately. Let's not forget, the terrain and weather were as much an enemy to you as they were to us. Your supply lines stretched thin, and the vaunted Blitzkrieg faltered in the snow and forests. Terrain, weather, surprise or not, a true soldier fights with what he's got. We regrouped, showed the world the U.S. armed forces don't just buckle under pressure. We push back, harder. Adaptation and swift recovery indeed played a key role. Intelligence might have faltered, but the strength and agility of the Allied response eventually turned the tide of the offensive. Intelligence must inform strategy, but as the battle progresses, it is the spirit and resilience of the troops, the commander's ability to adapt, that truly shapes the outcome. Your Western Front was a different beast, but the principle remains the same. Surprising you was one thing, sustaining our momentum was another. We stretched ourselves too thin and the surprise factor wore off sooner than expected. Ultimately, it was a gamble that didn't pay off as we had hoped. A costly gamble at that. It served to galvanize the Allied forces, cemented our resolve. In war, it's not just about the opening move, but about how you play the game to the very end. Indeed, it reinforced the need for constant vigilance, accurate intelligence, and the flexibility to change tactics mid-game. 
These are lessons well learned and paid for in blood. The Battle of the Bulge teaches us about preparation, the element of surprise, and the unyielding spirit of the armed forces. It demonstrated our weaknesses and strengths, shaping the final stages of the European theater. Let's tackle the role of terrain and weather in the Ardennes offensive. As we knew, the Ardennes was considered impassable for a large-scale offensive. Yet the enemy thought otherwise. Correct, Dwight. The Ardennes, with its dense forests and narrow valleys, suited our strategy of surprise. The winter fog and snow were allies in our advance. Overcast skies grounded your air reconnaissance and bombers. The Luftwaffe relished the cloud cover. Yet, Erwin, that same treacherous terrain and weather you counted as allies became your adversaries. Your panzers struggled in the mud, and your supply lines stretched thin. The Ardennes was no friend to either side, it seems. Terrain's what you make of it. Our boys learned that the hard way. When the skies cleared, we turned those same woods and hills into ambush sites. The weather didn't just challenge us, it honed us into a sharper fighting force. Adapt and overcome, that's the Patton way. In our experience on the Eastern Front, harsh weather was an ever-present factor. The German forces struggled in the Russian winter during their advance on Moscow. Adapting to the weather and using it to one's advantage is a principle that applies universally. Your Western Front was no different. Gentlemen, in the Pacific, we faced a different beast, jungle terrain and tropical storms. Yet the principle remains the same. Control over the air, adaptability on land, and mastery of the seas dictate the pace of a campaign. Your European winter warfare is an echo of the broader truth of conflict. Nature is an unforgiving general. Douglas makes an apt point. However, let me be clear. The initial successes of the Ardennes offensive were not mere flukes. They were calculated risks that capitalized on the element of surprise. Harsh weather was a double-edged sword. It sliced both ways. And it's worth noting, weather and terrain are but stages for the true theater of war, the contest of wills. Underestimating the enemy, that was the real blunder. Nature merely added another layer of complexity to our calculations. Complexity, yes, but also an opportunity. The Battle of the Bulge demonstrated the Allied forces' resilience and capacity to regroup under pressure. When the clouds parted, our air superiority became apparent, and the counteroffensive began in earnest. Erwin, the weather could shield you only so long before giving way to the Allied advance. And advance we did. Once the sky cleared, my Third Army was free to push back hard. The terrain that once favored the German surprise attack turned against them as we regained ground. In the end, it's not just about adapting to the weather or terrain. It's about dictating the terms of the engagement. Weather be damned. Indeed, General Patton. The strategic initiative always dictates the outcome. Terrain and weather, while formidable, are obstacles to be overcome. The Red Army's philosophy was to use these elements to our advantage, turning the harsh climate of the Eastern Front into a weapon against the invader. This discussion underscores the multifaceted nature of warfare, the interplay of strategy, terrain, weather, and human resolve. The Battle of the Bulge was as much a fight against the elements as it was against the enemy. Each of you, in your respective theaters, understood this interplay and used it to inform your command decisions. The challenge of overcoming both the natural and man-made obstacles defines the craft of military leadership. Let's focus on the initial German advances and the Allied setbacks. The element of surprise, along with aggressive tactics, gave the Germans early successes. Thoughts? The Blitzkrieg tactics which we applied took full advantage of the initial shock and disarray within Allied ranks. Rapid advancement was crucial exploiting the momentum to press further into enemy territory before they could mount a cohesive defense. It was warfare at its most dynamic, relying on speed and surprise. That so-called surprise was a failure of intelligence and reconnaissance, not a testament to German tactical superiority. The lack of preparedness put us on the back foot, true, but it was a temporary setback. The resilience of our forces, despite the initial shock, prevented a complete German breakthrough. Resilience, yes, but let's not sugarcoat the chaos it caused within our lines. 
It required immediate and decisive leadership to rally the troops and mount a defense. It's in the most dire situations that true leaders emerge, adapting swiftly to the unexpected. The confusion was momentary. The American fighting spirit, combined with the strategic flexibility of our commands, allowed us to regroup quickly. The initial setbacks served as the crucible for our eventual countermeasures. Your confidence, it seems, blinds you to the razor's edge upon which those initial successes balanced the entire campaign. Had supply lines held and support been stronger, the outcome at that stage might have been very different. Supply, yes. The initial success of any offensive heavily depends on logistics and supply lines. Your blitzkrieg was doomed the moment your supplies lagged. We Russians learned that the hard way. It's a lesson, it seems, you've overlooked. Indeed, logistics and supply lines are the lifeblood of any army. But let's not forget the importance of strategic depth and reserves, something the Germans underestimated in their calculations. Underestimation and overconfidence on their part, certainly but it provided us with the opportunity to demonstrate the adaptability and resilience of our forces. It was a harsh lesson in warfare, but a valuable one. The errors and miscalculations on both sides were glaring. Yet it's these moments that test our resolve and our ability to learn, adapt, and eventually overcome. The initial German advances, though formidable, set the stage for a pivotal Allied counter. Let's delve into the Siege of Bastogne, a critical juncture marking both a ferocious stand and a turning point. Bastogne, the bastion of resistance. Airborne troops trapped, yet unyielding. Their tenacity, a beacon of Allied resilience. We held because we knew. To lose Bastogne was to punch a hole straight through our lines. Acknowledged, the encirclement was complete, yet Bastogne held. A thorn in our side, our logistics strained, the weather, our initial ally turned foe as supplies dwindled and the skies cleared for your air support. Leadership on the ground made the difference. McAuliffe's simple nuts in response to a surrender ultimatum epitomized the stubborn resolve. Yet it was not mere bravado. It was strategic defense at its finest. True, the symbolism of Bastogne cannot be overstated. The siege exemplified the strategic necessity of holding key positions no matter the cost. In the East, we too understood the value of such stands. However, Bastogne underscores the Western Front's unique challenges and the morale impact of a surrounded yet unbroken force. Let's not overlook the armored thrust to relieve Bastogne. My third army moved swiftly, not just driven by strategy, but by a moral obligation to break the siege. It was warfare in motion, the essence of American grit. Indeed, Patton, your maneuver was unforeseen, a tactical shift that buckled our perimeter. But stone was the linchpin, and its relief spelled the beginning of our retreat. A bitter pill, reflecting the ebb of German might. Air power, too, played its role. Once the skies cleared, we could unleash hell from above, weakening the grip around Bastogne. Ground and air, together, turned the tide. Bastogne stands as a testament to allied unity and determination an emblem of how tactics, leadership, and sheer will can overcome the severest of encirclements. Unity, yes, but let's not diminish the calculated risk and the strategic foresight required to hold and then break the siege. It was a chess game, played with the highest of stakes. A display of combined arms in action, indeed, the synergy between infantry, armor, and air key to modern warfare. Bastogne exemplified this, a lesson for any military strategist. Well said, gentlemen. Bastogne's siege and relief showcased the multifaceted nature of warfare, leadership, strategy, and the indomitable spirit of the soldier. Logistics and supply lines aren't just the bloodstream of an army, they're its very life. The bulge demonstrated that to a fault. Bernard, the Allied supply chain, became a behemoth. Your thoughts? Certainly, Dwight. It's about the material and munitions funneling through to the front. Post-Normandy, our logistics operations were monumental. We orchestrated a symphony of supply that proved overwhelming. The Germans, on their part, were living on a prayer for resupply. While your symphony played on, ours was more akin to a funeral march. Fuel shortages throttled our panzer divisions. A meticulously planned offensive was crippled not by lack of will, but by the stark reality of our logistics nightmare. 
Our ambitions outpaced our supply lines, tragically so. In the Pacific, we faced our own logistical hurdles, yet mastery over supply chains was pivotal. The European theater was no different. Strategic bombing targeting German supply lines was a stroke of genius. It wasn't just about having more, but making sure your enemy had less. A dual-edged sword, really. Air superiority and logistics go hand in hand. My third army could advance as rapidly as it did because we, as we had the juice to go. Tanks don't run on dreams, but when you're grinding the enemy under your heel, you can't notch victories without shells and gas. Command is about foresight in logistics as much as tactics. The Red Army's success was also predicated on our ability to maintain and secure supply lines. We learned hard lessons from earlier in the war. Effective logistics, much like a steady supply of ammunition, ensures the enemy's downfall. Without it, you're merely awaiting your own demise. It's sobering, really. The strength of an army's heart lies in its supply. We were operating on a slit artery, and yet the Allied machinery ensured that even with setbacks, our advance remained inexorable. It's the unsung hero of any campaign. It's clear then, the outcome of the Battle of the Bulge was as much about what happened off the field as on it. Our success was not predicated merely on the valor of our men, but the efficiency and relentless drive of our logistical operations. Absolutely, it's the fuel, the food, the bullets. Without them, the bravest soldier can't hold his rifle steady. As in Stalingrad, so in the Ardennes the side that can supply its front lines, sustain its forces, and strangle its enemy's supply prevails. The battle is always for logistics as much as it is for territory. Well put, gentlemen. Our next discussion will pivot to the skies. Air Power's role in this theater was decisive. Let's pivot to the role of Air Power in the Battle of the Bulge. Our advancement was significantly bolstered by air superiority. Douglas, your insights from the Pacific are invaluable here. Air superiority is like holding the high ground in traditional warfare. Once we punched through the weather, our fighters and bombers devastated German lines and logistics. It's about dominating the battlefield in all dimensions. Yet, it was our lack of fuel and air support that crippled our panzers. The Allies' control of the skies was a death knell for our Ardennes offensive. Had we matched their air power, the outcome might have been quite different. Indeed, air superiority offers the eyes and muscle that ground forces need. Erwin, your struggle with air cover precisely highlights the edge it gave us. That, coupled with our ultra-intercepts, made your movements predictable. Air power is the anvil on which the enemy is broken. Our dive bombers served as the cavalry of yore, striking fear and disarray. A swift and relentless exploitation of air dominance turns the tide of battle like no other. The Eastern Front taught us the same lessons. However, it's not just about having air superiority, but how you utilize it in harmony with ground operations. Coordination and timing are critical, and the Germans learned that the hard way at the bulge. A point well made, but remember, it's not solely about material advantage. It's also about spirit, tactics, and the element of surprise. Sadly for us, the Allies had the upper hand in the air and on the ground in those decisive days. Spirit won't fuel your planes or fly them, Erwin. It was our industrial might and logistical backbone that kept our birds in the air. Air power in the Pacific turned islands into unsinkable aircraft carriers. Europe was no different. Airfields were critical. Our strategic bombing campaigns had been softening up German industry and transport networks long before the bulge. This indirect effect on the battle cannot be overstated. Without fuel and ammunition, no amount of spirit can hold a front. Quite right, Dwight. The ability to strangle the enemy's supply lines from the air while providing close support to our ground forces was a game changer. It allowed us to exploit gaps and pour forces into them rapidly. Let's not forget, gentlemen, that grit and gallantry on the ground are amplified a hundredfold by mastery in the skies. Each tank and infantryman felt the weight lifted when they heard the roar of our planes overhead. Indeed, Patton. The psychological impact on both our troops and the enemy was significant. Superiority in the air demoralized the Germans and bolstered our forces. It was a multifaceted tool, not just a weapon. Clearly, air power played a pivotal role in turning the tide of the battle. It was not just about the numbers, but the strategic application that made the difference. 
let's remember the synergy between ground operations and air support as a cornerstone of modern warfare. Let's tackle the crux of our counteroffensive strategies. Erwin, the initial successes of your forces were notable, but where did you see the point of failure emerge? Our planning was marred by overambition and underestimation of Allied resolve. The fuel shortages, the relentless Allied airstrikes once the weather cleared, these elements stymied our advance. But it was the Allied counterattack, their ability to mount a rapid and coordinated response that truly spelled our doom. A classic case of German hubris, Erwin. We, the Allies, excelled in coordination among our multinational forces. My planning for the counterattack emphasized fluid movement, striking precisely where we perceived the weakest points in your lines. It was our logistical prowess and intelligence gathering that turned the tide. Coordination? Bah! It was the sheer audacity and tenacity of our fighting men, the aggressive stance we adopted. We didn't sit back and plan forever. We hit back hard and fast. That's the Patton way, and that's what broke the back of the German offensive. It's interesting, George, but aggression alone solves nothing without a system to support it. The Soviet way emphasizes the strategic reserve, the ability to absorb an initial blow, then counterattack with overwhelming force. Your counteroffensive benefited from a similar principle, whether you acknowledge it or not. All of you speak of tactics and immediate strategies, but overlook the broader implications. Superior air power and logistics, adaptability on the battlefield, the principle of island hopping I employed in the Pacific, these are the tenets that ensure victory. Your European theater was no different. Douglas, your island hopping campaign bears little resemblance to the European front. Our problems were not just logistical, but also tactical. We faced a different kind of warfare here. The intelligence and deception leading up to our counteroffensive set the stage. Wouldn't you agree, Erwin? Surprise was not solely the purview of the German forces. Indeed, Dwight. The failure to anticipate your countermeasures was a critical lapse. But let us not pretend the outcome was predetermined. It was the culmination of several factors, including the unexpected resilience and rapid mobilization of your troops. And let's not forget the role of leadership in adapting to the unfolding situation. It was exemplary on our side, ensuring units were where they needed to be and understood their role in the grand scheme. Leadership is paramount, but it's the application of combined arms, integrating infantry, armor, and air power that dictates the outcome of modern battles. Your European strategies finally caught up to this notion. Enough about air power and combined arms. The real lesson here is about the fighting spirit. You can have all the supplies in the world, but without the will to fight, they're worthless. Patton makes an unexpected point. The spirit of the soldiers, their resolve, and the strategic depth of reserves are what truly turn the tide of battle. Your counteroffensive served as a testament to these principles. Gentlemen, our discussion underscores the multifaceted nature of our counteroffensive strategies. From leadership and logistics to adaptability and fighting spirit, each played a pivotal role. Let's remember the sacrifices made and the lessons learned as we continue to reflect on our experiences. Let's delve into the psychological warfare known to all of us, the impact the bulge had on our men's spirit and command decisions. Douglas, you've seen the influence of morale in the Pacific. Draw us a parallel. Morale isn't just a word in a soldier's dictionary. It's the ammunition they carry in their hearts. In the Pacific, an indomitable spirit was essential for surviving the jungles and the Japanese. But in the bulge, the sudden German onslaught tested our men's resolve like never before. It wasn't just a physical fight. It was a battle against the fear of encirclement, against the cold, against the unknown. Leadership was crucial. A leader's fear is the quickest path to a unit's despair. I cannot speak for the American spirit, but I'll tell you, the early successes of the offensive bolstered German morale remarkably. Each advance was a proof of our might, even when resources were thin. But morale is a fickle ally. When the tide turned, it waned just as quickly. It's the realization that the Fuhrer's promises were unreachable that struck hard. Oh, I'd say morale is worth a division any day. When I rolled tanks toward Bastogne, 
It wasn't just to relieve the town. It was to show my boys and the world that when Americans commit, hell itself can't stop us. The Nazis knew their game was up when they saw us coming, not because of the guns, but because of the iron will behind them. That's a rather theatrical take, George. Yet, can't dismiss the value of theatrics in leadership, I suppose. The psychological impact worked both ways. Your flamboyance might have shaken the Germans, but steady informed command reassures your men. Knowing your commander has the situation in hand, that's what keeps the line steady. Leadership on the Eastern Front meant pushing men through conditions that would freeze the very marrow of your bones. German or Russian, the soldier fights for his comrades, for survival. The motherland calls and you answer, regardless of the cost. But morale is tender. It needs truth, not just bravado. Our men knew no retreat, for the price of failure was too high. Truth be told, a soldier's spirit isn't forged in the field. It's brought from home, fueled by the cause. It's the reason to endure, to outlast. Your Bolshevik resilience, Georgie, and Patton's unyielding aggression, it's two sides of the same coin. Truth, propaganda, it matters little in the face of defeat. Spirits soared when command promised swift victory. As the offensive faltered, so did belief in our cause. A leader's role, then, is to prepare his men for hardship, not just victory parades. Preparing for hardship means expecting to bleed for every inch. When my boys understand that, they become invincible. They don't fear hell, they bring it with them. This roundtable takes no singular stance, but it's clear the psychological warfare we engaged in was as multifaceted as the physical. Each front, each leader utilized morale differently. The lessons learned in the bulge in regards to the human spirit are as critical as any tactic or strategy employed. Let's carry these insights into our concluding thoughts. Let's pivot to the strategic lessons drawn from the Battle of the Bulge. Our ability to adapt and overcome was pivotal. Thoughts? Indeed, Dwight. The battle illustrated the sheer value of adaptability in modern warfare. We refined our tactical responses on the go, which proved indispensable. It's a testament to effective command. Flexibility, yes, but let us not overlook the consequences of stretched supply lines and overambition. The Ardennes Offensive, ambitious as it was, demonstrated the limitations of Blitzkrieg when faced with logistical nightmares and staunch resistance. Overambition? I say underestimation. Our enemies underestimated our resolve and our capacity to hit back hard. That's the lesson. Hit the enemy hard and keep on hitting. Adaptability is crucial, but so is the unrelenting pursuit of offensive action. The interconnectedness of global theaters can't be ignored either. Strategies employed in Europe had ripples across the Pacific. It's a global chess game. Every move here impacts the board elsewhere. We must think globally in our strategic planning. Absolutely, Douglas. And let us not forget the operational art developed during the battle. It wasn't just about tactics at the front, but also strategic reserves, the depth of defense, and counterstrikes. The Soviets refined this on the Eastern Front, adding a layer to military doctrine that the Battle of the Bulge exemplified in the West. It seems, then, our primary takeaways involve the importance of flexibility, aggressive countermeasures, and the holistic view of global strategy. The battle also underscored the value of intelligence and the perpetual need for innovation. Wouldn't you agree? Innovation, yes, but disciplined application thereof. Our ability to innovate under pressure, maintain supply lines, and adapt to the terrain and weather conditions spelled victory. Intelligence failures were a critical lesson for Germany. Superior firepower means little if you're blindsided. The Allied quick adaptation and eventual counteroffensive took advantage of our operational overreach. Speaking of counteroffensives, nothing speaks louder than a well-timed aggressive push. Our resolve in Bastogne and the subsequent pushback was a lesson in audacity. But let's not forget logistics. A force's greatest plan is as good as its supply chain. The Pacific taught us that, and Europe reinforced it. Superior logistics often decides the victor. And from a Soviet perspective, the emphasis on deep battle operations and strategic reserves became principles that shaped our victories. The ability to absorb the initial shock, then outmaneuver and outfight the enemy with reserves became a cornerstone of Soviet military art. From logistics to leadership, from deep battle doctrine 
to the paramount importance of adaptability and resilience. The Battle of the Bulge serves as a cornerstone in our understanding of modern warfare. It's apparent the lessons learned here resonate across all fronts and theaters of war, shaping our strategic and operational mindsets for future conflicts. As we close our discussion, let's reflect on the enduring impact of the Battle of the Bulge. The German offensive, though initially successful, marked a critical turning point. Perspectives? The Bulge exposed the Wehrmacht's dire straits, our fuel shortages, the attrition of our forces, and ultimately, the futility of offensive operations when lacking air supremacy and logistical support. A hard lesson, but there it is. Indeed. The battle underscored the importance of adaptability in leadership and tactics. Even as we were caught on the back foot, our ability to quickly regroup and counterattack was decisive. Flexibility, not rigidity, paves the way to victory. Lessons learned from each theater of war have a unique cross-pollination effect. The bulge reinforced the necessity of superior air power, robust supply lines, and the integration of intelligence with ground operations, principles we applied across the Pacific. Aggression, always aggression. The counteroffensive demonstrated that victory comes to those who dictate terms, not to those who wait passively. Our response in the Ardennes was an assertion of that very ethos. The Soviet army had learned much about the devastation of winter warfare. What transpired in the Ardennes echoed our experiences on the Eastern Front. Superior numbers and a relentless pursuit, coupled with the element of surprise, remain unmatched in their effectiveness. Yet, the engagement also revealed the Allies' underestimation of the German will to fight. A cautionary tale of hubris, perhaps, reminding us of the war's unpredictability. Our hubris, perhaps. But it was German desperation that led to the bulge. The strategic miscalculations spoke volumes of the desperation at the heart of the Reich's command. Desperation or not, the Battle of the Bulge provides a stark lesson in the theater of war. Never underestimate the enemy but never assume you have lost until the final act is played. And speaking of acts, our swift and decisive reaction turned the tide. Let that be the lesson. When the enemy pushes, we push back harder. It's the American way. It's the way of the victor. A display of resilience, without a doubt. Yet the deepest impact lies in the understanding that the fervor of the soldier on the ground, coupled with the acumen of leadership, can alter the course of battle, indeed of history. Our deliberation here underscores not only the Battle of the Bulge's tactical and strategic lessons, but also its broader implications for military doctrine and leadership. This confrontation bisects the narrative of World War II, highlighting the adaptability, resilience, and indomitable spirit of the armed forces. Let's carry forward the lessons learned with respect for those who served and sacrificed. Our duty to history is to remember and to learn.